Hey guys, I'm Richard Fitzgerald. This is Dubai Works, where we interview the business leaders making a difference in this great city. That business with scalability was very interesting to me. I like building something that has legacy. Dubai Works Business Podcast. This week, I have a very exciting guest. Uh, I'm joined by the CEO of Fine Hygienic Holding, uh, James Michael Lafferty, uh, who, who is responsible for uh, lots of household brand names that you'd be familiar with, and also has uh, a lot of experience in other fields and other areas, such as the sporting uh, industry as well. So we're, today, this morning, we're going to be talking about uh, fine holding and the history, the heritage in the region. Uh, we're also going to be talking about uh, running a hygiene, hygienic company, during a global pandemic, uh, and also uh, FMCG in the area era of digital transformation. So, good morning, James. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And very nice to speak to you. Uh, you're working from home, I take it. I am working from home about ninety percent of the time. Yes. Oh, very good. And what what does the other percent of the time entail? To offices or factories or? Well, the the uh, our factories are obviously still running, uh, but you know, to minimize the amount of interaction and maintain good social distancing, we're still working from home for people in roles that can that can work from home, like the office environment. Okay, uh, can, can, for those who aren't as familiar uh, with Fine Hygienic Holding and the heritage and the history of the company, um, can you give a bit of an overview of the story of the company and also the remiss that you have here? Sure. Uh, yes, very quickly. I think uh, many people look at stories like uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs starting up Apple and Microsoft in garages, and they, you know, it's quite an inspirational story. But I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen an inspirational story uh, that matches up to fine. We were founded uh, 63 years ago by our founder, Elliot Nuckel, who, who is still, uh, still active and still involved. Uh, he was a Palestinian refugee with about three dollars to his name, and he moved to Jordan uh, during the the partitioning and during the you know that that period of in the late forties, and basically uh, started up fine by importing some paper products. And then he was always committed to quality, and he was always committed to doing the right thing and ethics. And people began to trust whatever he put his name on. And it started from importing some stuff to building the first factories in Egypt and Jordan and expanding to become today, you know, the leader in the MENA region and on its way to an IPO and in all kinds of categories from, from not only the original tissue products, but diapers, now face masks and gloves and, uh, you know, just the uh, disinfecting wipes. All, all of this is now part of the portfolio and we're, one of, if not the largest FMCG in the region uh, that has its roots and origin. And we're proudly of Jordanian birth and we're, we're always be proudly Jordanian. Amazing backstory. In a previous role, I actually visited the Nukul headquarters in, in Amman. So I'm familiar right. with, with the story, but I think for many people, <clears throat> they know of the fine brands uh, and they'll, you know, uh, rare or all too infrequent do we see brands from this region compete with the global behemoths uh, in the FMCG sector. What do you think of the story that you told, you know, you touched on quality, but what do you think really is the secret to success to be able to have uh, a product and a brand that has lasted the test of time and also uh, competed with the global uh, conglomerates? I, you know, I think that the company started and was founded on, on very strong principles. And, and among those principles was not only a commitment to quality and doing the right thing. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. And, and today I still find competitors that they, they will advertise there's 100 sheets inside the box and you count there's only 95. I mean, they're doing that. You know, I don't think it's by mistake. I think it's being done, you know, with deliberation. You know, that's something we would never do. You know, we if we're going to put 100 sheets in, we put 100 sheets in. If we're going to err on it, we'll put 101. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, it, it's doing the right thing and it build, that's what builds a brand is uh, a brand that people can trust. And, and I think the second thing is, is I've, the company has always been committed to its people. 
And it's an, as a result, it's hired great people, treated them well, and they stay for an entire career. And it's a company of huge loyalty of its employees. And so you put that together, you have great people that love the company and love the business and, and they want to protect the business. And you have a set of values that basically establishes that this brand is something you can trust and count on. Uh, yeah. That's that's what allows a brand to sustain and to compete against the very best out there. Amazing, fascinating. Uh, you, you know, the recruitment and uh, providing so many jobs to the local people in the countries that you're in, especially in Jordan, and contributing to the economy must uh, generate a lot of goodwill as well. Absolutely. And I think the relationship that we have with the Jordanian government is is nothing short of fabulous. They've been incredibly supportive and always attentive to business needs. I think the, the, the entire direction of, of the Jordanian government towards pro-business and pro-foreign direct, uh, you know, foreign direct investment has been uh, impressive. And certainly how they've handled COVID-19 is a benchmark for not only in the region, but for countries around the world. Uh, I mean, there's certainly a, a number of countries that I can think of that are highly developed that could have learned many things from how Jordan handled this and how they flattened the curve quickly and now have a declining curve. What were, what were some of the things that you saw uh, that were done in Jordan? Well, they went to masks um, uh, very quickly. I mean, the mask, you know, when this thing is all over, the whole mask story is going to be uh, a huge area of focus because you had you had authorities everywhere telling people not to wear masks. Mm -hmm. And now everyone is saying you have to wear a mask. I mean, the, the irresponsibility of some leading authorities in different parts of the world in regards to masks, it's just, it's just shocking. I mean, in late January, I interviewed a leading virologist in the world. And the guy says to me, look, this is obvious. If 50,000 Chinese people have this disease, it's airborne. You don't get 50,000 people infected off doorknobs. Mm. and off of tables. They, 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 they're breathing it in. Since they're breathing it in, the number one thing you can do is not washing your hands. That's important, but it's not washing your hands. It's wearing a mask and covering your nose and mouth. And we launched masks in January. And we, I made my whole organization mask up from January. And Jordan did the same thing. Jordan was masking up in Feb and, and then putting laws in place to wear masks in public places. Then they did a full lockdown not a partial, not a halfway. They went to a full lockdown and they did massive amounts of testing and tracing. I mean, it's all the fundamentals that New Zealand did, that South Korea did. Uh, they, they just moved very quickly and, you know, they shut the flights down very fast. They shut down, uh, you know, people coming in from the outside. And, and, and with that, they were able to manage the caseload. They did a great job. It was decisive. Uh, it was okay in some respects. Some people can say it's controversial. You make everyone wear a mask and there's, there's actually criminal penalties if you don't. Yeah. And certainly there's many people in the, like the United States that would argue against that and in individual liberties. But sometimes you have to make decisions to protect the population. And that's what they did. And, you know, I, I tip my cap to the Jordan government for the great moves that they made. Interesting. It sounds like a lot of that uh, it, impacted your decision making of how to transition the business as well um what you know to go to masks <laughs> soon uh was that something that was already in production did you have a product and what other products have you uh rolled out in the in the meantime well we 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 believe in we're a wellness company in essence we're not a paper company we're a wellness company so all of our products are formulated to improve the lives and the health of the world's consumers. So we had been sterilizing our tissues for a long time. Mm. And, you know, I frankly, I can't understand why anyone would buy an unsterilized tissue. You go to a doctor and he says, you know, open your mouth and he puts a tongue depressor in. That tongue depressor has been sterilized. I mean, he doesn't put an unsterilized uh, tongue depressor in your mouth. I mean, they're doing this to prevent, you know, infection. You take a tissue, you touch your eyes, you touch your nose, you touch your mouth, you even touch yourself in very sensitive places. Why shouldn't this be sterilized? I mean, it's amazing to me that we buy unsterilized tissue full of germs and then we wipe our mouth with it. So we have been sterilizing for a long time. And this company in Switzerland, a, a group of geniuses named Living Guard Technology, uh, based out of Zug in Switzerland, 
they had developed a technology that not only kills germs, but it keeps killing them for an extended period of time. So if you put it on your tissue paper, it's not only sterile at that moment, but it stays sterile for a year. And so even if you're sick and you sneeze into this tissue, the germs get killed inside the tissue and then you don't infect anyone else in your house. So we were messing around with trying to make this work for two years, mm. long before COVID was even in the, in the public mind. We had been trying to make it work on paper. We knew it worked on fabrics easier and the technology was better for fabric than for paper. We were doing experiments and we were working on masks and other items like hospital scrubs and gloves. And then COVID came and the, the deciding thing was the interview I had with the leading virologist in the world who told me, you know, Jim, let me be honest with you. Everybody should mask up. And this was in January. Right. And with that, we said, we're going to go with masks. And when I came out with masks, everybody laughed at me. Uh, even my own salespeople didn't want them, said, I don't think I can sell more than a thousand masks. And today we've, you know, we sell half a million a month. Of, uh -huh. of reusable masks and it started with there was only a thousand in demand and why we followed the science and we followed good common sense if it's very clear that COVID-19 loves the human respiratory tract it has an attraction rate to the human respiratory tract that's 10 times of SARS the original it was you know this basically this virus is, is designed to come and infect the upper respiratory system of a human being if that's the case, and it's, it's basically contracted through inhaling drops of virus, a mask is absolutely critical to protecting people, and it's not debatable. Now, someone can hide behind the scientific method and say, I haven't seen the data yet. Uh, you know, I, I find that to be, you know, a really a cowardly approach to, you know, using our brains. It's very obvious how we catch this, and it's, it's very obvious that a mask can help. And I think everyone's come around from the Centers for Disease Control. Now the WHO, you know, basically authorities all over the world now say we need to mask up. And you can see the correlation of countries that have been implemented mask regulation versus those that have not. It's very straightforward. The United States leads the world in infections, and the United States is the most undisciplined mask wearing country, you know, in the in the world right now. What what you know, talking about products and market fish, why do you think that is? Uh, you can produce the masks, the science back them up that it works, but somehow I, I personally had never worn a mask in my life. The behavior wasn't in the Western world, even in this region much, um, in parts of Asia. But is there an education process that's needed? Is there a marketing process? Or, and, and do you think that's happened now? It's happening. It hasn't happened yet. Sorry about that. Um, uh -huh. Somebody at the door. <laughs> the, um, there, there is a bit of an education, and it, it's shocking. I mean, I okay, I'm a physiologist by training, so I have a good science background and a good understanding of microbiology. But you know, a basic health class in high school will teach you about viruses and bacteria and about how they're contracted. And I, I mean, if you go back to when the Spanish flu impacted in the you know the early 20th century everyone was masking up i mean we were smarter in in the early 1900s than we are today mm. i mean and, and then you know you have this this convolution of discussion like people saying it infringes on my civil liberties i mean come on mm -hmm. really there's all kinds of laws i mean the, the the equivalence of civil liberties is not you get to do whatever you want i mean if you walk around uh, you know take all your clothes off and walk around nude you'll be arrested I guess you can argue that that's against your civil liberties, but you know, there are, every country has laws and to protect the population, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a proven fact that if you are sick, a mask will reduce your ability to get someone else sick. So if you care about the people around you, you care about the world, you wear a mask, not just even to protect yourself, but to protect the world around you because you may be asymptomatic and you may be able to spread this disease without even knowing it. And you know, these videos of people in, in supermarkets going and coughing on other people on purpose. I mean, this is the most abhorrent, you know, selfish behavior I can, I can imagine. They don't care about anyone but themselves. Is, do you think it needs, there needs to be more regulation around imposing mask wearing and, until a vaccine or, or for a foreseeable future? On a personal level, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, 
this, this, the, I don't sell masks because we sell masks. I sell masks because it's the mission to help the world. Mm. You know, every person that wears our mask with an antiviral technology, it's potentially saving a human life. And, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's appalling to see how people talk about herd immunity and it's like, well, let the old people die. Let, let's send the kids back to school. Only 2% will die. I mean, how can we have these discussions? This is someone's family. Mm. This is someone's child. This is someone's mother or father. You know, all life is precious. I mean, I'm pushing 60 years old. I'm now on the high risk. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's also emotional for me to have these discussions because people say like, well, let the old people die. You know, let's call the herd. <laughs> That's nice to say in, until you're in the group that it's supposed to be called. So I think there should be. This is about protecting the people. I applaud what the UAE government has done to make it a law. I applaud what the Jordanian government has done to make it a law. I don't applaud like my country, the U.S. government, where people don't wear masks and they, they flaunt it in public and go walking around touring. The head, the head, Vice President Pence, who is the head of the task force, refuses to wear a mask in public. Mm. I mean, where's the leadership in that? Where's yeah. the leadership in that? And, it, you know, every American that dies to this, you have to stop and think, could we have saved them if we had masked up properly? And that's how I view it. And so, yeah, this is a, there's nothing wrong with passing laws that I don't like wearing a mask. I, I agree. I don't like it either. It, in, in, it does impact your breathing a little bit and they're not always comfortable. I, I get it. But I also don't want to get sick. And I also have a wife who has some pre-existing conditions and autoimmune disorders. I don't want to bring home an illness to her. I mean, if I love my wife, I wear a mask. I don't go around and, and cry about civil liberties. You there's do no what's you know, right for your family and what's right for people and what's right for, for you know, that, that's the, the principle, protect life. Yeah, it's a, it's a strong point. And, you know, we see a lot of other arguments as well on social media. And, but I think people have appreciated, uh, you know, in, in times like a global pandemic to take experts' advice. Um, you, the, what you're talking about is, that related to ethics of good business, do you think there's a responsibility on businesses to, uh, to be involved in uh, things like this for the better good of a society? Um, and how, is your, how do you view ethics in business and good business in general? I think that you can't even separate ethics from good business. They are totally intertwined. And I think business has a huge responsibility. I mean, I've had so many, we're a paper company and our basic. Do you know how many people have come to me to say, let's get into the disposable mask business and let's make money on disposable masks? I can't even count the number. And what is my answer? I don't care how much money we can make. I'm not going to pollute the planet, mm. pollute the planet by selling disposable masks. You know, we've done the math. You know, everyone, six months ago, my friend, everyone was stressed out about shampoo bottles and straws. Oh, we're, we're polluting the oceans and we're, you know, we're going to kill all the marine life. When you use a disposable mask, your personal usage of non-biodegradable plastic goes up 8x, eight times. Okay. So if the whole world goes disposable, every year of doing that is equal to eight years of plastic shampoo bottles and straws. This is how bad we're clogging. Walk around Dubai, all you see are masks and gloves floating in the water. Yeah. Or walk around the marina, uh, uh, walk around marina, all you see are floating gloves and masks. We have a responsibility in all these companies that have gone and jumped into selling disposable to make money or equipping their employees with disposable. Don't ever let me see you go out and say you care about the environment because you don't. It's easy to do a reusable mask that lasts a year. Yeah. It's simple to do. And, you know, I, I can't believe some of these companies who have stood on their soapbox and talked about uh, marine life. Yeah. And now they're giving only disposable masks to their employees. I mean, it's so irresponsible. I can't believe it. We have a responsibility to give back. You know, we, we've, we've already given $2 million away uh, to people less fortunate. Now you say, well, that's not, I've heard bigger numbers. Fine. But for a, a company our size to give $2 million is the equivalent of Apple computer giving half a billion. Yeah. It's I mean, that's the size of the prize. So we have to be responsible and morally ethical and do the right thing. And, and I don't think it's anything other than good business to do that. Interesting. I think uh, 
decision making like that during times like this can be good leadership, but also um, it is reasons why companies last a long time. Uh, but just a question on two technical things on production. You mentioned uh, the technology from Switzerland, but also sterilizing the, the tissues. Is, yep. How does that work in terms of a factory production line? Is there an extra stage? Why don't other companies do it? And what have you put in place? Well, okay, they're two different processes. The, the masks and the technology in the masks, the living guard, which is a, it basically disrupts the virus or bacteria by rupturing the membrane uh, through using ions. The, the wall of a, of a bacteria or virus is negatively charged. So if you introduce a positive charge, there's a disruption of the membrane. And so what we do is we have positively charged ions on our mask. Wow. That is being done in the factory that produces the fabric before we ever get it. So we buy treated fabric, we import the fabric into the UAE, we cut it and we make masks with it. Hmm. And so that's, that process is being done in a specialized treatment facility in Switzerland. And, and we have nothing to do with that process itself. We buy the finished fabric. The SteriPro technology, which is sterilizing a tissue, is being done by ultraviolet rays at the production line right as it's going into the box, we are killing everything on it as it's being packed. Uh, we do have patents on that. Uh, and so we are patent protected. And, and that's, you know, I think the reason other people don't do it is one is, is intellectual property. And secondly, it costs money to do it. And it costs capital because every production line in my company, and I have dozens of production lines, has an ultraviolet system on the line and that costs money. Mm -hmm. To buy that to install it to maintain it you know costs money and many people in the paper business are are here just to you know pack it cheap and sell it cheap so they're not looking to add costs what we know about production and manufacturing now uh, might be in, in terms of sustainability might be more advanced than when Nicole or when fine was founded if you were yeah. building a, a company uh, from the ground up today uh, what would you put in place that maybe isn't in place in the factory production process at the moment? I, you know, I, I think it, it's not so much that, you know, because we've been, we've continually invested. I mean, we invest between 20 and $30 million a year in capital just to upgrade our technology. And so we've, we've kept pace with it. I think the, the, the bigger question is, is uh, I think we have moved to an outsourcing model uh, you know, for, for technology and acquiring technology. And I think the, this open source model is a very successful model. And that's how we found Living Guard. I mean, we didn't invent Living Guard. We found a, a startup company in Switzerland that was doing it. Mm. And I, I think trying to do all your R&D in-house is a very, very difficult mm. process because, uh, you know, you, you need scientists in so many different areas and, and the, the, the staffing complexities are huge. I think it's better to go out and what we have been doing recently, and we, sh we could have been doing it even earlier, is going out on an open source model, finding startups with great ideas mm -hmm. and working with them. And, you know, the Living Guard partnership, uh, I mean, it you know, went from nothing to selling tens of millions of dollars of product out overnight and saving, helping save people's lives. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that project because it's not only profitable for everyone, but we're helping the world and you know, all of these universities that have tested our, our masks, you know, University of Arizona uh, a couple weeks ago and now University of Berlin and Aachen University in Germany, you know, the, the scientists that were interviewed said, I think this technology has a major role to play in combating COVID worldwide. Mm -hmm. I mean, I said, what a great statement coming from a scientist who has no bias. He's not, he doesn't have any shares in our company. He just simply is a scientist studying viruses and says, you know, this technology is pretty impressive. And you know what? This thing, if you spread it around the world, can save lives. That's, uh, you know, that's quite an endorsement. And that didn't come from us. That came from Living Guard. And it came from our willingness to work outside of our company. And I think that's the model going forward. Very interesting. Yeah, I think it's good that companies and governments embrace these technologies. We've also heard of innovations from the UAE and from Abu Dhabi in the medical space during COVID-19 as well, and they've been adapted elsewhere. 
is that a strategic approach? Is it related to digital transformation? Um, you know, the argument against uh, open source is that you don't have the IP, it can't be monetized and higher value in the future. Do you think that business nowadays and to tackle bigger problems like sustainability needs that sort of partnership approach and not profits at all costs approach? I do. I mean, and I don't, I think uh, what differentiates products often, it has nothing to do with, with uh, technical IP. It might have a trademark IP, but not technical. I mean, if you take our business in paper, I don't really have, other than the sterilization aspect, I have no IP protecting how I make a roll of toilet paper from someone else. Hmm. But, but what differentiates us is operational uh, effectiveness and efficiency and how well we make it with consistency. And then how we build a brand and market a brand and people say, I want that brand. Uh, and, and that comes down to the kind of people that you hire and the, the talent you put in place to, to, you know, to develop things like branding. And so I, you know, I, when I look at open source, I don't look at it from the standpoint of, oh, I can get a patent that, uh, you know, nobody can beat. I mean, even if you look at the Living Guard, they have dozens of patents, but already there are at least five companies who've come out with comparable technology that can be applied to fabric. Yeah. It, because people find a way around the patent. There's not, you can't live on a patent. What you have to live on is hiring great people, building a brand and executing it better than someone else. And that, that's, you know, where we try to make a difference. We make product more consistently better than other people. So you touched on marketing as well. How many brands do you have under Fine Hygienic Holding? And what's the decision-making process into creating new brands and new products? Well, we try as best we can to have a mega brand called Fine. And so we, you know, we have fine tissues and fine toilet paper and fine towels. And our masks are called Fine Guard. And our gloves are called Fine Guard Gloves. So we, we, that's our mega brand. And we believe in that because there's a synergy that comes in an advertising. When I advertise my tissues, it helps me grow the mask business. When I advertise gloves, it helps me sell more kitchen towels. And that's our main brand. Now, we have other brands in the company that are legacy brands. Uh, like Smile is in the UAE. It's a, it's a, uh, a lower tier uh, facial tissue product. We have brands like Nalras in, in Saudi Arabia, which is quite big. It's also a, a, a tier three uh, facial product. And then we have brands like Lido and Jordan and e Egypt, which again are a lower tier. But we, you know, we are a small mid-sized company, you know, based in the Middle East and, and focusing on MENA. It, it's important that we stay focused on the fine brand and that that's the brand that we try to drive and, and have it go across multiple categories. Now, you can't call everything fine. That, that You can stretch a brand too far. So when we bought the Nye Beverage Company, which is a healthy beverage company based out of, out of Saudi Arabia, we bought leading shares in that company. It's a great little company. We, have, we have, of course, are not going to change the name to Fine Beverages, you know, Fine Tea. I mean, you got you to gotta look at how far you can stretch. I mean, Fine is kind of a, a textile paper brand. I'm not going to say you should drink. I mean, I don't think anyone names a product that is a toilet paper also a beverage. Okay. And, you know, there's a certain scope that you can stretch a brand name. So, you know, we will be pragmatic about that. Okay. I'll always try to use fine, but if it doesn't fit, we will use another brand name. The, the tiers that you mentioned, is that in terms of price point for consumer or are there different categories that you have internally? Uh, it's, it's typically pricing and, and product performance. I mean, a... a a tier three tissue product is low priced and it's not as soft and not as thick as a, you know, a more premium tissue product. Interesting. Um, and in terms of marketing, how has your investments changed over the years? And then again, <clears throat> to COVID, uh, yeah, in terms of mediums and, and marketing overall. Well, we, you know, we were like any FMCG historically uh, up until probably two or three years ago, which was 100% of the spend was, was above the line. You know, TV, radio, print, outdoor, you know, the standard media vehicles. Starting in 2018, uh, we swung to about 80% digital, uh, and we've been there ever since. And right now, my current media and marketing spend is still about 80 to 90% digital. So you've uh, been from zero future. to 80 overnight, basically? Yep, overnight. 
Wow. Um, and we, we, you know, we, we played this, uh, you know, we got lucky and we made the right call, but we got lucky as well. We made a decision in 2018 that we had digital transformation was so important that it didn't, everybody puts digital transformation under the CIO. And they say, you know, it's part of the IT group. We felt that that's why no one is getting it is because they're burying it and having it stuck with discussions about ERP and discussions about Oracle and SAP. And, you know, these people have other things to do, you know, uh, you know, fixing people's laptops and, you know, getting people migrated onto a new system and all that stuff. Mm. So we decoupled at the time and we established a digital transformation department with a function head reporting to me. And so it was, had nothing to do with the CIO. The okay. CIO was in charge of the company systems and you know, cyber security and all that. And digital transformation was in charge of transforming the company digitally from e-commerce to our marketing online to all kinds of things, the IOT to virtual reality you know, projects. You had all kinds of different projects going on and tests going on. And we were way ahead on e-commerce. I mean, we were one of the preferred suppliers of Souk Amazon from the beginning. I mean, they have multiple times said, you guys are the best to work with. Nice. Uh, you take some of our product categories like diapers and in the marketplace, we would be like the number four diaper, but on Amazon, we would be number one because we were, we were ahead of even the big boys on how to work with e-commerce. And so obviously as this is now, accelerated under a COVID environment and people have gotten used to buying online and they actually like it. That part of our business has been booming, absolutely booming. What do you think of, and what's your view on m and in terms of, what do you think of the direct to consumer trend? How does it impact your business? Are people, is there a subscription model for fine tissues? And um, yeah, how do you see that playing out in this region? Uh, we're working on a subscription model. We have a small test going, uh, which is basically an IoT project where uh, in your home, um, there will be sensors that will detect when you're running out of toilet paper, running out of tissue, and then automatically trigger to you to ask a question, uh, you know, do you want to reorder and, and have it all auto ordered and, and then delivered right to the home. Because the one thing about our products in the tissue category is they're big they're huge, you know, they're, they're bulky. Now they're not heavy, but they're bulky. It's nice to have tissue delivered to the house. It takes, uh, it takes away from all that space that you're using in a car trunk or even carrying bags uh, of toilet tissue. So uh, we have those tests going now. I mean, we certainly see it to be the future, but sometimes these things take a bit more time. So we, you know, we're, we're testing it and understanding it and, and finding the glitches. For example, you have these, you have a sensor on the toilet roll that says, do you want to order yes or no? I mean, we have to ask ourselves questions. Like if the child's sitting on the toilet and says, oh, this is fun, and pushes yes 15 times, you know, suddenly there's a truckload of toilet paper delivered to the house and the mother and father don't know anything about it. And it was because you know, their six-year-old was having fun pushing buttons. You know, these are things we have to work through and yeah. figure out and you know, make them foolproof. So we're, we're testing. We have, a, we have some households that are using it now in, in the Dubai and trying it on a subscription model. And we're, we're finding our way and figuring it out. Interesting. Sounds like there's, they're the questions that you ask at the start of um, a new revenue stream and a new, new venture for a business. And you, you believe that it's worth investing in and this is the future of the industry? Yeah, I absolutely think it is the future of industry. And the smart companies are, you're always trying to, you know, I, I believe foresight is one of the most important skills of a leader, which is seeing around corners and seeing things coming. And, you know, this is, you go back to when Kodak was presented digital technology and they all said, this is stupid because they didn't like it. They didn't like it because they had factories building, uh, you know, making film. They didn't want to get into digital. They didn't want to shut down these plants. And, and, and so you kind of close your mind to it. Uh, the, there was no foresight that you could see easily who wants to, to deal with delivering film to a film shop and having it developed when you can do digital and review and, uh, and delete pictures and you don't have to, you know, I go back and half the role was terrible because something went wrong and you know, now you just fix it. You just delete right <laughs> off your phone. 
Yeah. How can they not, you know, how could a leader not see that? I know they don't like it, but you have to deal sometimes with a, a difficult reality. You know, I have many people in our organization that don't like the rise of digital um, e-commerce because they, you know, they're in the, they're in the bricks and mortar side of the business and it's a, it's a threat and they don't like it and all that. But, you know, I, my job is to tell them, look, this is the future. We have to get on with it. And, and, you know, foresight, I, I think is the most important skill a leader can have. And foresight is what led us to launching masks and becoming a world leader overnight is we saw where it was going and we looked at the data and we inter interviewed experts and we said, this is going to go global and they're going to need a mask that has an antiviral technology and we're going to go. And so when very few people were talking about COVID, we were launching you must have the obviously you know the backing of the team and the and the board to make decisions fast because some of the examples you know an innovation is that it's hard to change uh, organizations it's hard to ch you know sometimes decisions like that might um cannibalize existing revenue streams and uh it, you know is that something um that you think about how you how you create that culture of change within the organization? Uh, yeah, we, um, you know, look, I think I have a board that's amazing. It's, in a, it's the greatest board I've ever worked with in, in my life. And I've been on many different boards. I mean, it's a common, it's all the shareholders uh, and myself. And, you know, they're very supportive and they, they, they play their role very well, which is add value, but also, you know, on the day to day, allow the team to, you know, make those decisions. Now, when it comes to my team, I have a wonderful team. Uh, but, you know, I had a great boss tell me 30 years ago, uh, great leaders practice all forms of governance. Sometimes it's a democracy. Sometimes it's a dictatorship. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's socialism. It depends upon the situation. And, and if you're going to be a great leader, you have to practice all of it. And, uh, you know, I, I've told many people work for me. We may live in a democracy, but we don't always practice it in this building. And so when it came to the masks, there was a great deal of resistance and that was a time when I became a dictator. And so I, you know, it wasn't a problem. I said, we're launching, get on the bus. The, there is no, we're not going to have an argument on this. And, you know, and, and I'm always very clear with people. Sometimes we're going to do a vote and I'm going to ask, what do you think? Uh, and, and collect views and make a decision based on consensus. But that's not a hundred percent of how you should operate. And there are other times when, we have to be completely, you know, socialistic. I mean, if you take COVID-19, I've had a couple of employees die of this. We decided right in the middle of it that we should establish an orphan fund for their children to pay for their educations. Mm. And, you know, it, and that's a very socialistic thing to do. Mm. And we, we are doing that. And so every time that at least someone who passes away in our company from COVID knows I'm going to be giving their family a big sum of money to pay for their children's education for a long time. And I don't have to do that, but I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. And sometimes it's an outright dictatorship and you have people saying no, and you have people with all kinds of different views. And I have to cut through that as a leader and make a decision and tell people, look, sometimes I have to make a call. You don't like it. I'm asking you to get on the program because this is how it works. It can't always be, I do what you want me to do and you like what I do. Sometimes you, you don't like what I do, but, but this is a part of, uh, you know, sometimes you have to be a leader and sometimes you have to be a follower and good followers understand they got to get on the program. And so on the mask, which had no enthusiasm in January, uh, I basically mandated it. I said, you're launching in a week and I don't want to hear it now, figure it out. And that was the orders. And there was no, there wasn't a vote and it wasn't a democracy and, uh, I think now the team understands why we did that. So, I, you know, I don't, uh, managing up and managing down are two very different things that, you know, my management up is working with an amazing uh, board of directors that are just outstanding in every respect. And managing down, I have a wonderful team and they understand the rules that I want their opinions and I, I value that, but sometimes I have to make a decision and I can't please everybody. Sorry to hear of the losses, but brilliant examples and thanks for sharing. Uh, you mentioned at the start of the interview about an IPO. Is that something that was in the plans for a while? We don't often hear of it from family businesses in the region. Um, is it something led by you or the board? And, and how, does, how do you go about it? Is there 
would you know how do you weigh up the merits of listening in the region or elsewhere well uh, it's been in the plans for quite some time i mean because uh, in 2015 the family sold a significant stake to private equity the standard chartered private equity and i think everyone that knows in private equity that you know they don't buy to stay for a long time they buy to have an exit yeah now that exit can have many forms that exit can be an ipo and exit can be selling to a strategic uh you know buyer that there, there's different ways of exiting um but the you know everyone knows in a, in a private equity world that's the game plan you buy in you add value you drive up the value of the company and then there's an exit which is profitable for the private equity investor so when they did that in 2015, the game plan was we want to exit in you know in the next you know five to seven years, and and if we can IPO and that's the right thing to do, we should IPO. If if it's a strategic exit with a, uh, a strategic buyer, then that can also be a way. And that we've been on that path for the last five years. It's just now getting closer because the basic when you look at the basic metrics that you need to IPO, we're getting very close to where we're an attractive IPO. And so now there's also uh, uh, obviously a factor of timing in an IPO. Timing is everything. Is it the right time to do it? And which exchange and all that. So we're evaluating all options, but you know, IPO is, I think the one that many in our organization would want and, and we want to do because there's a pride element of taking a family business from Amman, Jordan, that has gone pan regional now has gone global and that company is out there with the big boys listed on the london stock exchange there's there's a certain pride i think many of our people who have spent years in this company and love this company they say this this is the kind of thing i want to tell my grandchildren about i want to say i was there when it was small and i was there when we made it a global player yeah. and i was a part of that journey and you know i was very proud of that you know one of my kids um graduated from this this boarding school in Florida and his he had, he had a girlfriend at the time and when I went to the graduation you know I met the girlfriend and she brought her family and her mother and father were former engineers at NASA in the 60s and 70s uh -huh. and you know I sat for three hours completely spellbound as they told stories about Neil Armstrong walking on the moon and they were part of it and it taught me a very valuable lesson about legacy they were now retired you know, this is their last child graduating from high school, you know, a late birth, uh, you know, kid and all that. But they were a part of something so special and so world changing that it gives them in their in their final, you know, in their retirement years, it gave them this joy and a peace. Like we were a part of something that the world was was blown away by. And I think deep down in all of us, we all want to say at the end of our lives, at the end when, when the working years are done, you want to look back and say, I made a difference. You know, I, I, I did something, I was part of something special and I made a difference. And I think whether we know it or not, we all seek and strive to be a part of that. And to go and say for, for someone from our region where we don't have hundreds and hundreds of examples of regional companies going global, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of examples of regional companies competing with the big global boys and winning to say i was a part of the fine company that's now that brand that you see everywhere in the world i was a part of that when it was in its early stages mm. and i was a part of taking it public and making it go global this is a a potential that a dream for people and it, and it gives your life such satisfaction beyond the things we do in our private life and beyond the the accomplishments of our children and beyond the kind of people that we are, this you've also worked on something meaningful. Mm. Because we all spend 30 to 40 years doing this stuff 12 hours a day. Mm. I mean, it's the most, uh, we spend more time doing this than any other thing in our life. And so I think when you can give people real meaning to their work, that that's when you've really got their full commitment and their full belief in what they're doing. Amazing, you make a fascinating point about legacy and inspiration. Uh, we don't see enough uh, inspiration brands, companies, people almost hero globally from this region. I think what, what you talked about, uh, you know, has parallels with uh, sports people in the region like Mohammed Salah, but also the story of His Highness in Dubai, where, uh, you know, the, the example to 
uh, do the mission to Mars next year to mark the 50 years is in part to uh, inspire what is a very uh, young uh, demograph in the region that they can achieve uh, great things. I've been trying to find a segue to talk about your sporting interests. And um, I noticed on your LinkedIn that you're involved in track. Uh, and I, I don't know, I was going to ask about the mask and wearing a mask playing sport. But uh, in terms of legacy and, and inspiration, um, what, firstly, what is your role in the sporting field? And um, the involvement in the Olympics and, uh, you, you know, it's a shame that the Tokyo Olympics hasn't taken place. Um, but what are we looking forward to next year? Well, yeah, I, I mean, let's, it, let's face it. I embrace my past with with joy and, and pride. It, it essence, my friend, I'm just a track and field coach. Okay. You know, that's all I was. I, I was a youth track and field coach in the early 80s in the U.S. Uh, I ended up. I, I found a particular skill, which was I was able to work with disadvantaged youth and kind of convince them, not all of them, I had mistakes made, but I was able to convince disadvantaged youth in the US to not do drugs, to not get arrested, to not engage in crime, but to listen to me and come and run and sweat every day and you can win some gold medals and we can take you to the Junior Olympics and all that. And I ended up, um, coaching a number of U.S. national champions, uh, junior champions. And I was basically then uh, placed as one of the coaches of the U.S. Junior Olympic team uh, back in the mid 80s. And uh, that's what I was doing. That's what I loved. And, and I was hired by Procter & Gamble as a fitness instructor in their company to teach executives how to lose weight and how to get fit. And through that, I was then recruited into marketing and went through marketing, became a CEO and and, you know, my life took a completely different turn, but I never left the world of track and field and, and wellness and athletics. And so I continued to coach individually on my own. And when I moved overseas, I started working with different uh, national federations who could use some help. So in Nigeria, you know, I coached their marathoners, the women marathoners, uh, you know, up into the 2012 Olympics in London. Um, you know, they didn't have anybody. And I said, I'll do it for free to serve the country. And I worked with their women marathoners and coached them and, and, you know, got them all running personal records and that. And then the same came true in the Philippines. When I went to the Philippines, again, they have a strapped budget. They can't afford to really pay coaches much. And I said, look, I'll coach for free. And, you know, and there was a big, a lot of press at the time because I accepted a salary of $1 a year. And I basically took on their projects. And, the, you know, the first project I took was a 35-year-old long jumper who was pregnant and had put on 20 kilos and they had a, basically abandoned her and I, I took her in uh, my wife and I paid for her housing and we coached her on my wife trained her on yoga and flexibility I trained her on strength and diet mm. uh, and then you know we took her back and she lo and behold qualified for the Rio Olympics with a new Asian record and was the only long jumper in the Olympics you know 36 years old at that time that was a mother, you know, with a babe, with a, you know, with a 18 month old son by that time. Wow. And, and I'm very proud of her. She didn't win a medal. Uh, you know, she, she didn't jump great. She, but you know what, she was one of the 28 women in the world to qualify for the Olympics. And then we took on uh, a pole vaulter who was a great kid. You know, one of the most wonderful young men I've ever met. Uh, and he got injured and tore his ACL. And no track and field athlete in the Philippines has ever recovered from a tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. And so he was written off and off the team. And you know, I went and met with him and the kid was devastated and, and, and we told him, you can come back stronger. And so again, my wife and I took it over. Uh, we coached him back to health and, and he went on to uh, set the Asian record, set the national record, set the Philippine record, set you know all kinds of records. He trains in Italy, and he's uh, ranked in the top ten in the world and qualified for the Olympics. And so, you know, we work with him not on everything. He his pole vault coach is a guy, um, uh, you know, who comes from the Ukraine who coached Sergey Bubka and Yelena Isinbaev. I mean, he's a, the most famous technical coach in the world. And I'm not a good pole vault coach, but on diet, you know, my wife works with him on full diet, on flexibility. My wife runs his full flexibility program. I coach him on basically strength and, you know, and, and biomechanics. 
Right. And, you know, he's, he's a, he's a metal candidate for Tokyo for sure. Um, he's very young, you know, he's 24 years old and still developing. And, you know, I think he's a, he, he's the dark shot to win, you know, gold, silver, or bronze in Tokyo 2021. So that's my involvement. I obviously still coach my, my employees. I mean, we had uh, 60 employees run the Dubai marathon. I coached all of them and I ran with them and, you know, I was there to make sure they get through it and they're safe. You know, I believe in a strong mind and a strong body. And so I'm still coaching people, but from an elite athlete standpoint, it's only a handful now. And it's, it's on a, you know, we do it for free. We do it for love and we do it to, to serve. You know, I have a great deal of passion for the Philippine nation. And I believe in sports as a nation building vehicle. You, know, you can build national pride and that, you know, the Brazilians have correlated economic development to the, how their football team does in the world cup. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's national pride when they win and we're the best in the world. And it, it leads to investment. It leads to uh, all kinds of knock on effects. And I think a country like the Philippines is a great nation. And by winning that Olympic goal, which they have never won. And it's a huge, this huge shadow that hangs over the country by winning that elusive Olympic gold, I think it will open up the floodgates of potential of this great country. And I, I, I live 12 years there and I have great love for the country. Interesting. Amazing. I'm really taken in by all that. I, I try and do uh, as high participation in triathlon as, as much as I can and have a, a coach and he, it's a full-time job for him and he gives me a schedule on training peaks. So I commend you on being able to do that and run a multinational company as well. Um, and it's amazing to see it uh, overlap within an organization. I think it's a credit to you and fine that that, that many people partook in, a, in any distance sport. So uh, I'm sure people get a lot more out of it. And another reason why I'm sure they're proud to be part of the company. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, thanks a lot. I'd love to talk more, uh, but I think that's all we have time for today. Um, and, uh, Thank you. Best of luck in the future. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. All right, take care.